Welcome to lecture 10 on carbohydrate partitioning, physiological and ecological considerations part 3. This lecture is part of the plant physiology subject which is offered in the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology at the North Melbourne Institute of Technology. If you would like to find out more about this subject or the degrees that we offer, please visit our website at www.nmit.edu.au. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. We are learning about the processes of plant physiology by taking a virtual journey through the plant. In the first lecture we were introduced to the subject of physiology and subsequent lectures have allowed us to travel from the roots all the way through the xylem up into the leaves where we have looked at depths of some of these mechanisms in the leaves such as photosynthesis. We've travelled back down the phloem and now we are looking at carbohydrate partitioning which will take us into the roots. Please ensure that you have watched all the previous lectures as many of the concepts that you have learnt here in those previous lectures you will be required to apply to this lecture. As in part two, we will consider both photosynthesis and carbohydrate partitioning in the context of the physiological and ecological considerations. In this lecture, we are going to consider two abiotic inputs. The first is temperature, a very important component to particularly carbohydrate partitioning. And the second abiotic input we will look at is carbon dioxide and its concentration and how it is impacted, how it how it impacts in both photosynthesis, the light reaction, the carbon reactions and subsequent carbohydrate partitioning. So let's start with a, a discussion on acclimation and partitioning of photosynthates. These are the products from the carbon fixation of photosynthesis. Eukaryotic organisms have to mobilize sugars from the cytosynthesis, what we call source, to cells that use them for growth or energy, and we call these sinks. Arterials of animals transport glucose, conducting vessels of plants transport sucrose. Photosynthetic assimilation of carbon dioxide yields sucrose and starch as end products. Sucrose is synthesized in the cytosol, while starch is synthesized in the chloroplast. During the day, sucrose flows continuously through the plant while starch accumulates as dense granules in the chloroplast. The figure on the screen in front of you is from the recommended reading on plant physiology, figure 8.14. What it shows is the different structural components and where the different sugars involved are synthesized. You will see during the day that starch is a product of the Calvin-Benson cycle, as we've discussed in some detail. Also products of this cycle are the triose phosphates and the hexose phosphates, and these all go to, to produce the compound sucrose. Sucrose moves in, from the cytosol into the vascular tissues, where it is then transported through the plant in the vascular tissues or phloem. Sucrose can, use, can be used for growth or it can be converted into starch and fructanes and used for long-term carbohydrate storage. In the cytosol of the chloroplast, starch is produced. It can be broken down into glucose or maltose. This can also be broken down into sucrose, which can again be moved into the vascular tissues. The relationship of photosynthesis as a function of temperature is described as a bell shape. And this is shown for C3 and C4 plants in the figure below. However, two contrasting responses reflected by temperature, optimum when each species grown in its own habitat. For example, the example of the hot desert C4 
is more optimal at a higher temperature, just over 40 degrees, than the example of the cool coastal C3 plant. CO2 diffuses, described here as CO2D, from the atmosphere into the leaves through the stomata into the intercellular air spaces, then into the cells and finally into the chloroplasts. Just as high CO2 diffusion is photosynthetic limiting, so is low CO2 diffusion. CO2, CO2 diffusion is a trace gas with an co approximate concentration of 0.039% of air. Because diffusion rates depend on the concentration gradients in leaves, appropriate gradients are needed to ensure adequate diffusion from leaf surface to the chloroplast. The cuticle is nearly impermeable to carbon dioxide diffusion, so the main entry is via the stomatal pore. CO2 diffusion into the air spaces between the mesophyll cells is in the gaseous phase while the remainder of the diffusion pathway into the chloroplast is in the liquid phase. Sharing the stomatal entry pathway by carbon dioxide and water pre presents a functional dilemma. In high humidity, the carbon dioxide diffusion gradient that drives water loss is about 50 times larger than the gradient driving carbon dioxide uptake. In dry air, the difference is greater. Thus, a decrease in stomatal resistance through stomatal opening facilitates higher carbon dioxide uptake, but higher water loss. There are three main points of resistance of the supply of, supply of CO2. The first is the boundary layer, the second the stomata, and the third the intracellular spaces in the leaf. The boundary layer results in unstirred air around the, under, the leaf surface. This is known as the boundary layer resistance and it decreases with leaf size. Stomatal resistance is the main limitation to carbon dioxide diffusion. While the resistance incurred in the intracellular spaces is small. So where inside a leaf do the maximum rates of photosynthesis occur? The light enters the upper surface of the leaf. Blue and red photons are preferably absorbed by chloroplasts near the surface while green photons, or light, penetrates deeper into the leaf and is effective in supplying energy within the leaf, depleted of the blue and the red light. The figure on the screen describes the efficiency of light absorption at different wavelengths of light. This is the evidence for the statements made in the previous slide. Different wavelengths are absorbed at different depths in the plant tissue. For many crops grown in controlled environments such as glasshouses or greenhouses, optimal water, nutrition and enriched CO2 can result in increased productivity. Photosynthesis can be expressed as the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the leaf and this is referred to as CI. This enables evaluation of photosynthetic limitations. Increasing carbon dioxide concentration at which photosynthesis and respiration balance each other defines the carbon dioxide compensation point. That is, the point at which there is no net fl um, flux of carbon dioxide from the leaf. When you look at the figure on the screen and examine it in more detail, it can reveal the following. In C4 plants, photosynthetic rates saturate at internal carbon dioxide values of 15, reflecting the effective carbon dioxide concentration mechanisms. In C3 plants, increasing CI levels stimulate photosynthesis over a broader carbon dioxide range. 
In C4 plants, the CO2 compensation points is nearly zero, reflecting low levels of photorespiration. While in C3 plants, the carbon dioxide compensation point is about 10, reflecting carbon dioxide production due to photorespiration. The screen on the slide reflects atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations at previous stages throughout history. The figure on the far left shows that many years ago carbon dioxide levels fluctuate quite a lot. From 1960 there has been a gradual increase of carbon dioxide levels. Responses from the plot of carbon dioxide compensation points indicate that C3 plants may benefit from increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. Photosynthesis in C4 plants is carbon dioxide saturated at low concentrations. Therefore, there will be little benefit to this group of plants with increased carbon dioxide concentrations. The ancestral photosynthetic pathway is the C3 photosynthetic pathway. During geological time periods, when the carbon dioxide concentrations were higher, carbon dioxide diffusion through stomata would have resulted in higher CI values, thus higher photosynthetic rates. Although photosynthesis in C3 plants is carbon dioxide limited, they account for approximately 70% of the world's primary product productivity. While C4 photosynthesis is an evolutionary adaptation and evolved more recently, between 10 and 15 million years ago. In recent years, there have been much debate about carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere and how they may increase into the future years. So, assuming they do increase, how will photosynthesis and respiration be affected by the increases of carbon dioxide concentration levels at 400 parts per million or more? In order to try and answer this, scientists have been doing experiments on free air carbon dioxide enrichment, or called FACE for short. These experiments involve chambers or areas where plants are subjected to both normal or current day carbon dioxide levels and other containers or areas where the carbon dioxide level is increased. This can provide new insights into how plants will respond. For example, 20% increases in photosynthetic rates in C3 plants and none in C4 plants. Plant can grow quickly and uh, growth may be constrained, uh, reduced by nutrient availability. The figure on the slide is a visual representation of one of these face or free air carbon dioxide enrichment experiments. Here you can see chambers or areas where carbon dioxide is delivered to the plants, ensuring higher levels. The growth and the development of the plants are then compared. This face experiment in soya beans filled in Illinois shows that there are areas <coughs> of where the, f the, s the enriched CO2 is delivered results in warmer conditions and average warmer temperature of 27.5 degrees compared to the ambient CO2 where plant temperature is 26.1 degrees. In order to enhance your knowledge on both carbohydrate partitioning photosynthesis, physiological and ecological considerations, I would like you to watch the following YouTube videos. There are two. One is on the biology of plants and the second is on photosynthesis. Please take notes from these videos and insert to you, into your lecture notes here. I would like you to read the Tays and Zeiger 2010 Plant Physiology, Chapter 10 on Photosynthesis the physiological and ecological consequences. This reading will add to your lecture notes for part three and part two of this topic. Please insert your notes from your reading here. So in part three, you should now have an understanding of heat loss strategies in plants 
and how they're impacted on photosynthesis and partitioning. We've looked extensively on temperature and how this impacts on carbon fixation mechanism. How different concentrations of CO2 can influence this process and the role of carbon dioxide in the transpirational compromise. We've looked at the concept of internal CO2 concentrations or CI and what these means. You should be able to have an understanding now of how photosynthesis relates in applied context. We finish this by having a look at some of the future aspects of photosynthesis.